And I show up at Abbey Road, uh, uh, not at Abbey Road, um, what was that? The Maida Vale. Oh. The, the house in, in Maida Vale with a big sheep dog. And, he, and I think Mal Evans was there. I think Mal, uh, you know, some other people in his entourage. And I think one or two people from mine. It was very small. We had some dinner and then we watched television. And, you know, just sort of uh, got together and, you know, had a good time. And just talking about, you know, stuff. And he invited me, uh, he, so he was the first Beatle that, that I met. But he invited me to uh, uh, Abbey Road Studios the next day or, or so to come in and, uh, and uh, come to a session. I don't know how far you want me to get into this, it's, but it, uh, keep going, right? A lot, uh, yes. <laughs> a lot of people uh, have heard this story. Um, I I don't know what I was expecting. I guess some kind of crazy beetle mania, love in, freak out, psycho jello <laughs> thing. So I. Uh, Got dressed up accordingly in my tie-dyed underwear and my <laughs> paisley bell bottoms, and I had my hair all up and linen glasses, and I was feeling no pain, shall we say? <laughs> <clears throat> and a Daimler, Princess Daimler, uh, Daimler limo, picks me up. It's like two o'clock in the afternoon or something, in the middle of the day. Drops me off all by myself. I walk in. Nobody there except the four guys sitting in folding chairs and just jeans and, and t-shirts. Looked like my high school gymnasium, all just fluorescent lighting. And I'm like, where are the girls? <laughs> John, uh, uh, George Martin, in the booth in that studio, over at Studio Two, uh, in a three-piece suit. At two o'clock in the afternoon, I think you had to do that if you were a staff or my staff. And just four guys, and I'm just speechless. I mean, I don't know. I'm trying so hard to make an ass out of myself, but I already have by showing up in paisley underwear. And I'm, and I never forget. Uh, John looks up and says, "Hey, monkey man." <laughs> That's what he called me. It's better than Monkey Boy. Yeah. <laughs> and then it was, ah, uh, we'll get <laughs> Terrible accent then, I'm sorry. Uh, you want to heal? Look at him. And I'm, uh, I'm like, yeah, cool. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to be cool. Ah, like, oh, far out, John. <laughs> and he points up to George Martin, and George Martin hits the the button on a four track tape recorder and I hear good morning good morning mm. uh, the tracking of it and I think a, a scratch vocal or something like that and I we listen in and then <laughs> then all of a sudden it's like oh tea time lads <laughs> and this guy from the EMI uh, or whatever it comes in in a, a tie and a white you know long uh, service coat with a tray of tea, and we sit around a little tea table. And again, I'm trying so hard not to wee my pants. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what's it like, man? Uh, 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 uh. And um, we have tea, and I'm not kidding. Like 20 minutes later, like that, London says, "Right, like, uh, back, right back, right back, my mind. right back, back in my mind." So, I mean, that was the. In retrospect, that's. What, you know, and I've heard stories also since then that he was really like a slave driver. About it. And he was very serious about it. And they are northern lads, and they were like back down the mines, you know. And then I started to realize how they could have possibly come up with that library of material in a relatively very short time. Because there was no bullshit around it. It was like down the mines every day like that. It was a fascinating uh, experience. So I, uh, we hung out. They threw us a party one night at the Speakeasy. And were the other monkeys there at this point? Yeah, I think so. And <laughs> I, I, I told them I had a great time. I vaguely remember moments of that night. 
Uh, John, I know, was there. I remember him, definitely. I believe that Mick was there. I think Eric Clapton uh, or, and, and some people. And, you know, most of the whole, the whole kit and caboodle, Brian uh, Jones, I think, I'm pretty sure was there. It was a big turnout and a big party, and I frankly do not remember a whole lot about it. Um, some of the aftermath, I do. Um, but uh, over the years, we, you know, we started to hang out. You know, the, the Beatles, uh, uh, in a funny way, the British, uh, uh, from my perspective, my point of view, because I moved over there years later, so I'm living there, they got it. They got what the monkeys was all about way before people in the States, especially the hipwazee, as I call them. And uh, in the States, as everyone knows, we got a lot of crap about it, mainly because people just did not get what it was, because it never happened before. Little crossover in television and music with Ricky Nelson, but just that, that much. Never before had there been had there been this concerted <laughs> assault on the consumer. <clears throat> but ultimately, and I didn't even figure this out until years later, the monkeys was much more like the Marx Brothers than the Beatles. And it was John Lennon was the first one I ever heard say that before I, I it even occurred to me. The monkeys was a television show about a band, an imaginary band, that wanted to be the Beatles. We never made it on the television show, and it's an important, it's an important point. We were always trying for the success, so it was that struggle for success that I think helped endear it to, to all those kids. We wanted to be the Beatles. We had a poster of the Beatles in the set that we'd throw darts at. <laughs> And, and so some people got it. Some people that mattered to me, John, uh, the other Beatles, um, Frank Zappa got it. Andy Warhol came up to me once and was like, good going, I, you know, I get it. I really get it. Uh, Timothy Leary wrote uh, two or three pages in his book, Politics of Ecstasy, uh, about the monkeys and bringing long hair in the living room and all that. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned, you mentioned the Marx Brothers. I think it was, uh, it's pretty common knowledge that Harpo was the quiet Marx Brother. Yes. Yeah, like George is the quiet Beatle. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But I wanted to ask you, uh, Peter, uh, when, since Peter and Gordon were going strong for those uh, years following the British invasion, were you still in the inner circle with the Beatles? Uh, and with all of the British bands? I'm trying to think what you, what what period that was. Was I that one? I, I yeah, well, '66 and '67, Sergeant Pepper kind of just what Peter. Uh, yes, no, Sergeant Pepper. Paul was still started. living in our house, um, so yes, I mean we would get to have quite a lot. Yes. Where for Paul to scratch up enough money to get his own place? That's a good question. Um, I don't know actually. It's probably the easiest thing, and I was never to look for someone to live. But he did buy the house in Cavendish Avenue, St John's Wood, um, while he was there, and then of course moved in. But. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't go to the sessions that often. I'm still trying to figure out how I missed that party. I, I watched that, <laughs> for some reason, I watched that speakeasy for that party. I don't know why not. And I was at the speakeasy most nights. So <laughs> I spent two years there one night. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, don't, I mean, no, I probably I wouldn't consider myself part of the inner circle. The, the inner circle's always really been them and Neil and Mal and a couple of kind of childhood friends and not much else, you know, they kept themselves to themselves. But I did have the privilege of hearing some songs and, and you know, hanging out, having dinner from time to time. Did, did Paul compose yesterday? Because he, in, in your family yes. home, because he, he talks did. about getting out of bed and running to a piano. Yes, he so, did. So were you aware of that? I was away at that time. First person to hear yesterday was my mother, actually. Um, because you, you probably know the story, Paul woke up with the melody completely written in his head. Um, and Paul was convinced that it was an existing song. So he wasn't going around seeing it to people going, look what I've written. He was going around seeing it to people saying, what is this? You know, what, what song is this? It's in my head. And um, my mother was quite extensive knowledge of classical music, so she said we didn't know it. And then he finally played it to George Martin and other Beatles, and they went, no, I think, I think 
think you invented it. No, nobody knows to do what it is. But it's the only time it happened to him evidently, was that he woke up with the tune completely written in his dream, obviously, and he woke up fully formed. He said, no lyrics. That's where that whole scrambled egg story and all that stuff comes in. But, but the, the melody was just done. Um, which just got to reinforce the fact, we all know to be true, that even when you write a song very deliberately, you still don't know where it comes from. I mean, nobody does. Where, how people sit down and come up with a song, consciously or unconsciously, is one of the mysteries of life. You know, people just do or come up with amazing songs. And you'd think there wouldn't be any notes left at this point, but there are. People still manage to come up with brilliant melodies all the time. So since we have Britain Meets America here, did you feel that there was competition, or did you feel like we're all rising to the top, and we're having this success as an American artist and as a British artist? Well, initially, no. We, we for, for, for whatever reason, it looked to us like something the British were taking over, because, because we were. You know, I mean, that was what had happened, was America sucked in uh, this whole British invasion thing with such enthusiasm. Um, but then, um, and of course, the monkeys were away that came bouncing back to us. And you're absolutely right, we loved them the minute we saw it and heard it. And we didn't expect to. As I've talked about, we all thought, oh, this is going to be really bogus, you know, when they're doing kind of Beatle rip-off, you know, you know, Dick Lester imitation editing kind of thing. Because we'd heard about it before we saw it. But when we saw it and heard it, the songs were great, the, the, the cast was great, the show was funny, and it was the kind of humor that appealed to us, which is kind of Marx Brothers-ish humor, combined with our version of that, which was a kind of Spike Milligan Peter Sellers. Um, because we loved all that, and so we became huge, huge monkeys fans immediately. Um, but in general, there was a period when, Ameri when American music did seem to be taking a back seat, even though it was the music we all loved. We were buying American R&B records that the Americans weren't buying. And a lot of the cover songs that everybody did, you know, when Rudy Blues did Go Now, all the animals did House of the Rising Sun, or, or the Beatles did Money, or any of those songs, half the time, Americans were hearing them for the very first time. They didn't know us rising. They didn't know going out. They didn't know money. They didn't even know Twist and Chat Rock. You'd be amazed how many people thought that was a Beatles song. And so we were essentially reminding America of the incredible musical heritage you had already and still have. So, Mickey, did you appreciate the British music that was coming in, much like Ryan Wilson was in competition with the Beatles for Pet Sounds, for Sgt. Pepper, back and forth? Did you feel a spurt of creativity and energy? <coughs> After hearing I'm not sure competition is the right word. Um, uh, it, it, there was so much to go around uh, at the time. The, the charts, it was huge. music was just huge. Uh, the charts were huge, and always had been in the states. You know, very diverse the charts, um, always um, until way, way later, decades later, when they started uh, being more specific. But there was no separate country chart, R&B chart, this chart, that chart. There was the top 40. And you could have the Beatles and Sinatra and Pat Boone and uh, Eric Burden and the Monkees and then Doris Day. Uh, <clears throat> for a period of two or three years there, um, it, the, the charts were all over the place. And, uh, you know, Green Beret or, or, or something. And so I never felt personally like there was any any personal competition. I think that the competition, the level of competition would have come from the uh, record company executives and the distributors and the rap jobbers and the, and the people that were actually trying to, to get the stuff on the radio. And it was, it was tricky. I mean, uh, the, the record business at the time, as you've all heard, was, shall we say, slightly nefarious at times. <laughs> Um, I don't know what it was like in England, how that whole payola thing uh, went down in England, but it didn't exist because we only had one radio station. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But in the States, it's common knowledge. You know, you had to know the right people, you had to pay the right people, you had to go up the chain, you had to work your way up the chain of, uh, you know, of the command through all these, uh, yeah. the, the, the rack drivers, the distributors, the promoters, the record company, the disc jockeys. The, and it's one of the reasons why I think that uh, the monkeys um, uh, did get a lot of shtick, a lot of, you don't mind me saying crap, um, because, and I learned this later on, years later, because I talked to some uh, people from record companies. And this one guy said, 
Yeah, we were pissed off because you didn't need us. It was the first time that some that a group had sort of just shot over, just <laughs> uh, shot over the whole process, the whole uh, the mechanism of getting a hit record. These radio stations and record stores, who had a lot of power, a lot of power, they had no choice. That show came on the air Monday night, and the next day, literally millions of of kids were going down to yeah. the record stores all over the country, all over the world, and saying, we want the monkey record, we want the monkey record. Want... And so they, it had usurped all of that power in those disc jockeys and those record company executives and the radio station program directors had to play the, the monkey songs. And of course they were just pissed off at the four of us. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're almost out of time, but I want to ask Scott to talk to um, Peter about his involvement with Apple and James Taylor. Yes, yeah, so I'm particularly interested. You know, um, Peter was, uh, you helped birth the singer-songwriter movement, I would think. In a way, yes. Taylor and, and, of course, Linda Ronstadt and so forth. But producing James